Welcome to the Sanctum Secorum podcast, where we plumb the depths of Appendix N as it pertains to the Dungeon Crawl Classics role-playing game. We're here to help you serve these literary offerings at your DCC RPG table. I'm Keeper Mark, and with me tonight are Keeper Bob. Hey, everyone. Wait, wait, and introducing Keeper Idris. <laughs> <laughs> Along with Keeper Jen. Hello, everyone. Any special guests, Jen? <laughs> I, no, for once, Vance doesn't want to be on screen. It's okay. <laughs> well, tonight we are going back to our Appendix N Deep Roots and taking a look at a time torn story by El Sprague de Camp, Lest Darkness Fall. Bob, do you want to give us an introduction? Sure. One minute archaeologist Martin Padway is casually ambling through modern Rome. In an instant, he is inexplicably hurled back through time to 6th century Italy, just before the Dark Ages. With one foot firmly rooted in the 20th century and the other tentatively planted in the Gothic area, Padway, now Martino Padway, Questor, uses his wits and his knowledge to change the course of history. Very nice. And so was the book. <laughs> I think this is going to be a really fun episode. Yeah. Uh, I mean, DeCamp or, or Leon Sprague DeCamp uh, it was always kind of an interesting figure anyway. A uh, founding member of the Swordman and Sorcerers Guild of America. And, uh, he worked at... at an inventor's center. He did so many cool things, but this, this was just an absolute delight. I was surprised that it was written in the time that it was, because it, it does have a, a much more sort of a modern sensibility to it for me. And that when I looked it up and saw that it was first published in Unknown magazine in 1939, I think, uh, it was, it kind of astounded me both for the how old it was, but also the period of time that it was written and published, because it was published in novel form in 1941 in the, the midst of World War II. And uh, I just, it, it, it seemed a little bit out of time itself, you know, just in terms of uh, how much more relevant it seemed now. So it does um, explain the Mussolini reference at the beginning. It does explain the Mussolini reference at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was uh, prior to World War II, wasn't it? Well, I think it came out in Unknown in, in 1939. And, and in the December of 39, yeah. Yeah, and then I think the novel was published in 41. So I don't know how what the difference, you know, between the, the Unknown version and the, the novel version, if it was expanded or not. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, this version of the paperback that I have has a third copyright by DeCamp in oh. 49. Oh, okay, interesting. So it, it's got copyright dates for 39, 41, and 49. Well, and if you want to look for copyright really dates beyond there, um, this this novel actually spawned three short story sequels by other authors. So there was the the uh, Apotheosis of Martin Padway by S.M. Sterling, and that was in a oh. tribute anthology dedicated to DeCamp, The Enchanter Completed, and it was reprinted in Less Darkness Fall and Related Stories. Hmm. Then David Weber did uh, Temporal Discontinuity, which uh, was released in like 2021, very recently. And in the same, in, in the same collection, Harry Turtledove did a story called The Fake Pandemic. So hmm. there's like three stories with Martin Padway that, that follow this but they don't all follow each other. <laughs> so, so like the second story is the second of the short stories doesn't, you know, ignores the first, but the third ignores the second, but follows the first, but it's, it's really kind of fun. And I mean, it's, it's a cooler version in my opinion of a, of a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. Right. I mean, you've got that sort of time tossed, Hey, let's invent things. And, and other authors have, have built on on the concepts as well. Well, that's so yeah. funny because it starts out with Martin and a colleague in present time, air quotes, 
Uh, 20th century, we'll call it that. <laughs> about, I mean, totally foreshadowing, hey, wouldn't it be weird if we, uh, if we were to fall into this time that we're studying? So it it's really helpful that he already knows the history. So he knew that the wall was about to fall. I mean, the, the darkness, the dark ages were about to come in. Um, yeah. As opposed to just the complete, what what is the name of the genre? I mean, you, you said- Alternative history? Well, like- I mean, that's- The trope, the, uh, what, fish out of water trope? I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it It's kind of interesting to me because I'm so used to reading and watching stories of this nature where- they know nothing about the land that they've land they, yeah, found themselves in. And yeah, this it's, is the opposite case. Yeah, it's not really clear in the very intro that he's got this kind of depth of knowledge, but over the course of the story, it's, you know, he's an archaeologist. He's got, you know, a lot of, he's, he's in Rome studying, you know, presumably some, you know, finds that are there. Yeah. And, you know, it turns out that it's the right, exact right type of knowledge, you know, for the situation where he's got, a detailed enough, you know, blueprint of the history of this period where he can react and predict and astound, right, all the all the people of this time. Um, Has so-and-so been murdered yet? What do you mean, <laughs> yes? <laughs> That's an odd way to phrase that question. I loved that. Yeah. And the way he skirted the witch hunt around that was just unreal. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, this is fun. It, it, and it, and it, I think it is, a, it's reflecting now where this rope is more present, you know, it's also worth going back to this time when this is relatively new, if not new, since Mark Twain, right, you know, in terms of this type of story, and it really did set the genre for the next several decades. Um, it's clear, you know, kind of why this was included in Appendix N and, you know, what, what sort of influences it had. I, I was also reflecting just, you know, the other DeCamp books that we've done for the podcast, at least the ones that since I've been on are The Fallible Fiend and The Carnelian Cube, you know, which both are very different, you know, and Carnelian Cube has a bit of a time travel, plane, planar hopping. It was a bit of a tougher read, I think, than this one. This one was much more of a page turn. Planar hopping, glue huffing. Yeah, one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it certainly shows his versatility, you know, as a, as an author. And it was fun to see this. Um, and I, I really love this quote that I came across from uh, John Campbell about um, uh, the difference between Unknown Magazine and um, the uh, Astounding Magazine that he both uh, edited. And he said, I edit two magazines, Astounding and Unknown. For Astounding, I want stories which are good and logical and possible. For Unknown, I want stories which are good and logical. So this is like, you know, <laughs> clearly up his alley in terms of like, you have the flash of lightning, he's back in time and you branch into their alternative reality but it's it is good and logical you know there are he, he's a very much a uh, you know organized and you know committed to this practical pragmatic person once he's back there and everything flows from there's that one instance of sort of unreality bending you know him back to the the past well and it's it's really it's a fascinating read you mentioned it really set the tone for alternative history and I mean, Harry Turtledove, who has written a lot of alternative <laughs> history, has said that DeCamp and this book in particular were instrumental in his mm -hmm. in his interest in the genre to begin with. I mean, this is this is an important work. And as for I think why it's an appendix N, if you look at because uh, I have a feeling this is this is one of those books that Gary and company had read before D and D. Because mm -hmm. I mean, come on, if you're a war gamer. This is yeah. right up your alley, yeah. right? Oh, well, we're going to have an alternative. Yeah. We're going to run the battle this way instead because we've got these forces. And I mean, it, it's how you would create scenarios for tabletop wargaming. So, of, of course, they would absolutely love this book. Yeah. It's funny you should bring up Harry Turtledove because I was thinking of the alternative history genre you know, back when we worked at B. Dalton. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty much entirely Turtledove. <laughs> and I just couldn't get into it. I, I didn't care for it. I kind of still don't. And I think the main reason for that is because 
as the story goes along in Less Darkness Fall, we don't have the history lessons crammed down our throat. It's just factual that these are the people here and, you know, this group and this group and this group. Uh, yeah, we're doing stuff with the goths. We're, we're bringing them in and we're doing this. There's no full explanation of their history. <laughs> the history of every single people that uh, group of people that they come across I mean you've got all these different cultures anyway that are just making Rome the mel big melting pot right and I kind of appreciated the fact that you're not going into detail and telling me who this person is who uh what a bloody John um I could probably look that up, but since the Dark Ages aren't a uh, deep interest of mine, I'm just going to roll with this, right? We'll just blend Bloody John in with Red John from High Crusade and roll right along. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, to your point, and I think one of the things that I liked about this was the fact that it was touching on history that I didn't know very well, right? Because you can always, you, when you talk about Roman times, it's always that sort of classical period, right? You know, um, when the Roman Empire was at its might, and that's Typically, what you get with this type of story, you know, and when I was reading the yeah. yes, preamble, I was you. like, oh, we're going to end up, you know, with, you know, Emperor Trojan or, you know, all these kind of like, you know, things that have been, you know, I think trod, well trod before. <laughs> but by picking this very specific, you know, like year or, you know, these mm -hmm. events, it is one of these things that's not, in my mind, at least, it's I, something I hadn't studied very much at all. So it, it does lend itself to that. Um, yeah, you don't have to know the history to enjoy it. But you sort of get this glimpse into, you know, Sparta Camp's deep knowledge of this, which is wonderful. And it's kind of it was fun to visit this time period, this, you know, this right before what Martin terms the fall. Right. You know, but it's it's really this this period when there's just this upheaval of people and, you know, competing kings and murders and you know assassination plots and marriages and all these things. And it and it and it's fun to explore that um, because it I don't think it gets a lot of attention in other works that I've read. Well, and... it's a, a huge heavy-handed uh, romance contingent either. He wasn't lost in his emotions. Right, he right. He wasn't raging about. There was He was a... terrified. <laughs> well, there was also he was using a lot of logic and critical thinking and a, a bit of uh, fast talk if you will. But I think the word Mark landed on earlier was pragmatic, mm -hmm. and that would probably explain why I enjoyed this story better than a lot that we have done uh, over the past few years. Well, and a lot of the a lot of the stories I read of this sort, I generally don't go for the straight kind of dry alternative history. I tend to prefer like uh, Gordon Dixon's George and the Dragon or High Tech Night, or even the Landover series by, uh, by Terry Brooks, where you've got someone from modern day, and now they're in a fantasy world, and they're, they're, using, they're using what knowledge they have. All well, on High Tech Night, it really it does impact history. But just, it, just so that it stays a little bit lighter, and I don't get you know, bogged down in massive historical details, but this story doesn't do that. This story doesn't bog you down in details. It gives you enough information so that you can go, Okay, I understand what's going on. I, I don't know who this person is, but I understand the context. I know what's going on. That's all that's important to the story. And you can just and, and so it doesn't disrupt the flow. And it, it it's such a nice I don't want to say it's a breezy read, um, but it flows so nicely. It, it it it's kind of an uninterrupted telling of the tale. You don't have to to stop and ponder and think. You can just immerse yourself in it yeah yeah it it really struck me as uh one of the first at least among the appendix end list with this trope oh and yeah 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 so. the fact that others have quote unquote improved upon it is dubious <laughs> I don't know if anybody's really improved. I mean, again, you know, Turtle Dove is like the camp was the master, right? He's the one that inspired us. Um, the one, the one thing I kind of wish they had done, simply because one of the first things he does, right, is he teaches them the the uh, the 
Arabic, uh, yeah, the, Ar the, Arabic, the Arabic number system, right? I really wish that the chapters, which were in the book we were reading, were all in Roman numerals. I wish they had transitioned. Because <laughs> that just would have been funny if they had transitioned from one to the other. Well, um, and he taught the he taught the bankers, uh, bookkeepers, the alternate accounting method. With the, kind of du the double entry accounting. accounting. And I'm just like, be still in my heart. And that's how he found out that somebody was uh, thieving from him later. Because well, uh, they, it, it was right there, open in the books to be found. Well, and I was so, in that sequence, I was so reminded there's a, a, a Canadian comedy troupe called The Frantics. Most people know them from Boot to the Head. And uh, they do they do a sketch called Roman Numerals. And as the, oh, as the older yeah. clerk is is raging, all I could think of was, "I'll never understand this, even if I live to be C." You know, that's all <laughs> I could think of. Um, and, but you know, the the people that that betray him and showing you know, the way the the legal system was really uh, <laughs> more more about you know who had already been paid off or had something to gain was, and... was very interesting. And the fact that he could be held on suspicion of, and that's it. Yeah. No, proof, no nothing. Just. It was fantastic. So and so says that you probably did this. Uh, yeah. She she what? claimed that you're concerning with the devil. So uh, we're gonna hold. <laughs> he does, and so Martin does exhibit a lot of very much practical knowledge that can sort of stretch the the you know the 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 truth uh, not the truth but the, you know the the narrative a little bit in my mind. But then I was thinking. Well, somebody in 1939 who's an archaeologist and studies these things and you know knows Latin has probably more practical knowledge than I do you know, that, you know, on the on the mechanical sort of aspects of things. You know, they, they've been able to study their minds to uh, with unfiltered through you know the rest of the noise that we have in our our world. But I just was thinking, like, if I got sent back there, just trying to teach or come up with a dull you know dull numbering accounting system or you know, craft lenses. I would have. I would struggle. You know. I think. Oh, I think yeah. That was tough. Movable, movable type. Yeah. When he when he tries to like make a watch and he's you know like the encasement is really hard. I just got everything else, but you know I couldn't. Or then, you know it was really put hard. The but the clock I, back. He he put it away. That's true. Yeah, that was actually fun. It was fun to see him like start a project and like now nah, I can't do it. You know, most stories I think would have this sort of like epiphany of like oh I got it working or the gunpowder you know works. The cannon, yeah. <laughs> But he had beat him like so failures at the first try, and he's willing to discard it and just focus on, you know, the politics or the you know the war or those kind of mm -hmm. things. I mean, that was actually kind of an interesting take on it. That's that's the other thing in the in that first in the in the early part of the book, like the first chapter or two, I read a passage, and I was like, that is that is so true of today's politics. Mm -hmm. I was I was just like, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And and it, it, I think it's the other thing that really supports the story and makes it fun is that it really is filled with these kind of very interesting characters that um play off of Martin. You know, we have we have a banker who's very much a you know, he's he's willing to to negotiate and barter, but he's you know, he does it in every every instance for any anything. We have like that sort of sullen bodyguard who's a you know goth, you know what if he even really is a, a prince or you know uh, uh, with an estate, and and just all these kind of like it's it's these these people are actually very rich, right? And it's not just a pastiche of yeah. They they all have solid uh, character traits that you can that you can identify, and they're not just they're not just a name on a page. Mm -hmm. They they have a lot more life to them. And come on, the still was the first thing that he invented. They, <laughs> they, 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 they had not even realized how to bend metal into tube shapes yet. Yeah. This is how far back we were. And yet aqueducts? Really? <laughs> that, that aqueducts don't involve really tiny it. copper tubes. <laughs> I mean, they knew what a tube was. They just didn't make them out of copper that big. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, he started out with a really crappy brandy. And 
by using really crappy yeah, wine. As it, it was also a uh, negotiation tool, if I recall. <laughs> well, I, I love, you know, the banker's like, oh, no, 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 I got this. You know, this restaurant, this restaurant owner owes me money, so he's going to buy the brandy. <laughs> <laughs> or the wine, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, he, he, oh, the, the he's going to buy the yeah, brandy for his restaurant yeah. because he owes me money, so he's got to do this. And, and that happens a couple times. This guy owes me money, so he has to do this. Yeah, very well. Nice to have a well-connected banker like that, our lender. Oh, Tomasa, he, he's fine. You just have to keep an eye on him. <laughs> right. <laughs> is, he, is he honest? Oh, yeah. You just have to keep an eye on him. And the other thing that's interesting is that over the course of the novel, like Martin's the attempts at you know these efforts get grander and grander you know eventually he's like leading the roman or the you know the, the, yeah. uh, the gothic army into battle and you know he's he, he's you know uh, he's got this unwillingly. Sort of well, yeah, yeah unwillingly but he's also like you know sort of like well it's simple i just you know i i raised my sword and i bashed a few of them on the head you know why are you exalting me in this sort of thing but i love at the very end of the book he's got these sort of like you know, future plans, you know, of, okay, now I'm going to start, you know, building this, uh, the sea, uh, the seagoing vessel, which can carry you across the, the, the Atlantic. And it's you know, going to go back to, you know, this other country. And, you know, I think it was Thomas is, you know, saying, well, why would you do that? And he's like, well, they have to, some this thing called tobacco over there, you know, which, which I've been missing a lot. So I'm just going to go do this. You know, he, had, he was very yeah. much like, you know, now that I'm here, I'm just going to make the most of it. And by the way, you know, I need some. I need some tobacco to make some cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, here's here's how you build a schooner. And uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go get some tobacco now because it uh, it has been way too long since I've had a cigarette. <laughs> one of one of the weirdest things right out of the gate was he kept saying, "Oh, I'm from America," and they just bought it because they'd I... never heard of the place. But there were so many other foreigners and oh well clearly he's from a place then they never asked him to point it out on the map <laughs> <laughs> well I mean, there I wasn't just, there wasn't story. really a world map like that though i mm -hmm. mean you know, i i still like you know i'm a congregationalist it's the closest thing we have to insert insert other characters religion <laughs> here right, right. Uh, and oh my god the, how about the religious riot you know, the, you, he goes into the one place. It's a no religious, you know, no no religious discussions allowed. And then he goes to another place, and one starts, and you see why, as they're all like, "Die heretic!" It's a big old <laughs> bar brawl, yeah. And they're just talking, you know, no, because there's, you know, there's Jesus either God, a man, or something in between, and he can't be God because there's God, and he can't be a man because he rose up, so he must be something. In Die heretic! And, oh. oh. <laughs> Oh, that was so, so, you know, they're biting, yeah. they're biting each other's ankles, they're shiving each other. <laughs> it's like it'd be a fun scene to watch. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's all, all helped by the brandy that was uh, being served. <laughs> well, yes, the one guy's like, "Why did you let me drink so much of that stuff? Right. I never would have started this conversation." Uh, yes, yes, very much so. Uh, I think the very end surprised me the most in that right. he doesn't leave. Yeah, so he doesn't leave. He's, in a story like this, it. the character mm -hmm. usually goes back home, right? Yeah. But he doesn't have a way home. He doesn't know how he got there to begin I mean, with. To his time. Right, but, but Something he doesn't know how he got happens. there to begin with. So yeah. it, it's, it's not like he could plan for it. It's not. It's not the Marty McFly, you know, with the time uh, lightning, you know, that that zooms you back to the future. He doesn't. Yeah, you know, like it's it's just this random event, and I love that. That's it. You know, it's just mm -hmm. boom. He's back. Um, okay, I'm here. I'm gonna make the best of it. Um, but yeah, it is this sort of open ended um, ending, you know, and I can see where the the sequels probably have, you know, something to build on from that. It'd be I'd be interested in reading those. Um, and, you know, also the other thing I found interesting about the ending is, you know, he doesn't get the girl, right? You know, which is this sort of like throughout the novel, he's sort of, you know, pursuing, yeah. pursuing this, this uh, daughter of, of, of like a Roman, you know, you know, citizen. And I was expecting at the end of this sort of like right off into the sunset moment, but it was, it was just, he was being practical again. It's like, you know, oh yeah, I freed the slaves that. That pissed her off. <laughs> and, and I'm, you feel like they burned our villas. <laughs> 
Okay, so we've got, we've got the new number system, we've got the new accounting, we've got the still, we've got the printing press. Crossbow. Telescope. Telegraph. Uh, modern war fighting tactics, I guess you could say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and uh, emancipation. <laughs> the brandy. Yeah. <laughs> An emancipation, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was... that's a pretty big uh, bucket list for any human these days. Yeah, what do you What do you do for an encore? <laughs> well, and I like the fact that he's like, you know, I can't, I can't build, I can't have him build a car. It would take lifetimes just to gather the materials. Yeah, he's like, well, maybe I'll tinker around with gunpowder a little bit more. <laughs> but I've got the sailing project that I really want to get underway. So. So yeah. Was this written before or after the Carnelian Cube? I'm pretty sure it was written after. I want to say the Carnelian Cube was from the 40s. No, I that think, yeah, the Carnelian Cube earlier. was written after this is what I think, but I'm not sure. I'm just curious because it's like night and day. Yeah. I mean, Carnelian Cube is, is much more like a 50s and 60s sort of vibe, right? Because of all the 67. 67, yeah, okay. Much wow. later. Wow. Almost 30 years later, yeah. Yeah. So a, a generation later. Um, yeah. I think we can agree that this one was better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I will not argue that fact at all. I will not argue that fact at all. And just as kind of a kind of a sweet thing about, about the camp, so this was published as a short story in December of 39. He was married in August of 39. He died in 2000, seven months after his wife passed away. Aww. But it was Aww. just one long, happy marriage for you know, 60 years. That's good. And she was someone that he had actually collaborated on a, on a story with. So okay. he, had, he had written with her. And it's just, yeah, these are just nice little things. Yeah. Well, I think we covered the book pretty well, unless there's anything anybody wants to say more, and we can go on to things to stat. Sounds good. Bob, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. You know, uh, first of all, I absolutely loved the sulfur bombs that he made. <laughs> <laughs> sulfur and cord so that he could let out this thick brimstone smoke to uh to terrify the uh the superstitious peasantry because he had he had originally fumigated his house because he discovered his housekeeper had lice and there mm. were bed bugs and so he'd, he'd use sulfur to fumigate the house and everyone had freaked out and so being able to use that as a fear tactic in well not just fear because it had that it, it, it caused oh, yeah. irritation in the odor too, right? Because that, that was the other thing. It just scattered people because of but, that. But as they're running, you know, they're like, oh, he's, he's made a deal with the devil. And <laughs> and that was that was fantastic. Um, for Tharic Staten's son, um, his his bodyguard mm. would be a great NPC. I mean, the, the personality trait of just constantly pining for the days well, you know, when I had my estate and I was rich, and then just the doom and gloom. Well, now we're now we won't even end up in an unmarked grave because they won't bother burying us. So this is our final <laughs> it's the constant swing between oh, I was rich once, and we're going, we're all going to die. <laughs> is is fantastic. It reminds me of. Um, in the Pridane Chronicles from Lloyd Alexander, there's a character named uh, Gloom, who, when he's first encountered, is a giant, and for the and then he he had been bewitched, and so when that was reversed and he became a normal sized person throughout the rest of the series, you know, when I was a giant, and so, <laughs> you know, when I was rich, you know, I had this this great sword, and just on and on, it was. It was wonderful. He's a lot of fun. I think he'd be great to stand up. And, and I, I love how, like, every time you, you find him, he'd be asleep, but he'd always be there at the right moment to discover the, the, you know, the, <laughs> the bookkeeping errors or the, you know, the, the stealing and stuff like that. He was, he was a good guard, but he was also, like, you, you know, Martin has the first opinion of him is, like, 
oh, this guy's just going to sleep all the time. <laughs> just well, he, was, he was a good he was a good guard, but a bad bodyguard, right? right. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Like, well, they're stealing from you. You know, this guy's stealing copper from you. Things, but, you know, men waiting to jump him and arrest him, he's sound asleep somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's just... So he's he's just a delightful character. And uh, Matha Swentha, mm-hmm. the uh, the the daughter of the of the queen, her just her entire well. Okay, so we're gonna get married, and so I know you slept with your housekeeper, so she has to die, and this person has to die, <laughs> and this person has to die, and it's all very matter of fact. And you know, mm-hmm. she—it's it, it, only personal in like the case of one person she wants killed. Well, he killed my mother, so he's got to go. I hold a grudge, and I just having her as a murderous NPC or long-term foil for a party, mm-hmm. because it's also matter of fact. I mean, it—it it terrified Martin, and it, it, it kind of it took me aback because it was just so casual mm-hmm. well oh oh well I, I when he's like I'm, I, I can't marry this woman she's crazy she's gonna kill all these people oh <laughs> i just remembered i have a wife back in america yeah. and, and, and she's, <laughs> she's getting ready to kill him and he's like um but i will send a messenger to see if she still lives and if she and if she doesn't we can still get married and she's like well then just send him with poison and if she still lives, then she won't, and we'll get married. And it's, it's <laughs> and she bears the wife no ill will. It's just that, as the daughter of a queen, she can have no rivals. Mm-hmm. And and that was really interesting. It wasn't this this you know bloodthirsty it's not hostility. Not emotional. Yeah. No, it was just it was just um, utter disdain for anyone beneath her. <laughs> yeah, they they just don't matter. Yeah. And uh, that makes for a good villain, I think. <laughs> Although she's a little gullible, I, I think. <laughs> well, yes. I'll, oh, I just remembered. I've got a wife back in America. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you're not just trying to get out of this? No, no, no. No, I just, re- I just thought of it now. <laughs> That's going to be my prop suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> A poison or or a wife in America? <laughs> <laughs> the excuse. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Mark? Uh, this one was, there was so much that, you know, it's hard to like think of like the stats because it's like modern stuff in ancient times. I love the sulfur bomb because that was a, a really neat sort of unique application of, um, of his knowledge, but in a very, you know, archaic sense. Um, what I was going to point out, there's a couple things. One is, the idea of ward locks, you know, so he's, I think, reviewing some of the, the the lodgings or I can't remember which one, but the locks at the time were just very simple. You know, they're, they're you know, a skeleton key essentially can open them. And that, for me, that's just a really yeah. good reminder that it most huge. medieval locks yeah. were pretty simple and, you yeah. know, it didn't take a lot to actually, you know, defeat them. And I think just as a, as a judge, you know, it's just, it's worthwhile to kind of keep that in mind as you're designing things that, having like a dc20 you know pick lock check is not necessarily realistic right it's it's unless there's some sort of magic behind it or something you know extraordinary about it most locks were you know what were called ward locks were just very simple and and intended to prevent people from the first you know layer of just opening the door or opening the chest and taking something it didn't take much longer than that to to get past them so i think just the idea of ward locks is is intriguing to me (laughs) and trying to be mindful of that when designing you know more realistic scenarios uh, not to say you can't have you know other things it's just you know it is one of those things that i appreciate about dcc where magic is rare you know there's magic items and equipment are something that you have to like quest for and earn and you know the idea of something being you know behind this very complex lock should be rare too um in some ways um i like that the semaphore telegraph um i really like that concept and i think it'd be kind of cool to have that in a in a setting you know something that can communicate across long distances it's kind of like that you know the the lord of the rings you know return of the king where the the fires go across the place yeah and, but it's a more you know it's using lenses and telescopes and probably some form of communication like you know like morse code type thing but you know he's able to craft this and it's 
it's its utility is just very evident, but it's also one of these ideas that, yeah, why didn't why didn't the people of this time think of this, right? You know, it's very easy to sort of like just put somebody up in a, a high elevated place and, you know, whether it's like a mirror or, you know, some other device, use this communication. I think this is something that's that'd be fun to have in a setting, you know, sort of like a an alternate medieval setting where this is, you know, uh, a practical use of communication. But how much time did it take him to get them to do convex for one and concave for the yeah, next? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the lenses were the the thing that he took a long time on, and having to get the shareholders together to, <laughs> to actually make the money to make it, to put I, a little bit of oh concave. yeah yeah and and then the uh, the king's son stole the telescope later yeah yeah. <laughs> Um, the last thing I was going to call out is the the reference to a homodryad, which is just this kind of one-off reference that he's calling Julia, I think. He's just referring to her in, in the midst of their, you know, his sort of drunken sexual encounter with her. He's, he's you know, referring to her as a homodryad. And that, you know, that is is kind of this Greek um, mythological creature that's very similar to a dryad. Some people think that it's the tree itself and that, you know, this entity is part of the tree and this, this feminine entity. But I I didn't see any stats for that in DCC. I know there are there are stats in other systems, although maybe I just didn't come across it in my research. And Bob, <laughs> you look like you have something to say. Yeah, <laughs> so so it, it's funny. So so hamadryad, so dryads are actually um, oak tree hamadryads. Okay. So there's there's different names for the the spirits of the trees, and they all fall under the Hamadryads. And uh, as I've been working on Caverns of Thracia, that's one of the things that I got to do was yeah. expand on the Dryad so that there's a total of eight or nine Hamadryads, and I believe they're also appearing in uh, Dungeon Denizens. Awesome. Okay. So, so that's so, something we could uh, tack on to our uh, show notes with for the things to reskin. Oh, possibly. I mean, yeah, it, it was. It was just. It was so much. It was so much fun to see. You know that little reference. I was like, oh, because they became so near and dear to my heart. <laughs> um, that's great. As, as I was working on it, and I'm like, oh, well, and then there's this, and you know these, you. Know, because they were they were sisters and so there's like named examples in mythology and there you know, of course uh janelle jacques had had brilliant examples in caverns of thracia to, to build upon and work with uh, and so yeah it was it was really exciting so yes um i don't know if there are currently stats available for hemodryads but there will be there will be <laughs> very, very awesome that's great <laughs> What about you, Jen? No, didn't we use the smoke or the sulfur bombs in the catapult? Yeah. Do we have catapults like statted up as weapons somewhere? I don't know if we've ever done siege engines. I know. I, I want to say I may be misremembering, but I remember um, Crawl Jammer had some vehicle or like you know large vehicle mechanics if i remember correctly and i think there may have been some siege engine stuff on those ships right but i may be misremembering some of that um, but i think it was crawl jammer that had like stats for vehicle combat essentially or ship combat and i i think there were some siege like engine devices I'm, on those but i I'm but i think that's the only thing i can think of oh my god i might have done the uh the night uh, i'm sorry the knights in the north with Arimati and them, I think they have some expanded equipment and uh, things like that. That we might be able to find the catapults and trebuchets. There. I I might have done catapults for the crawl the crawl seafaring issue. Come to think of it, oh okay, <laughs> it's been so long though I don't remember. <laughs> um, You're falling into that trap, Bob. Oh, I long I long ago fell into that trap. It's it. But the the other uh, large scale thing that I would love to see statted up would be a mass printing device for spell books. Oh my God! How dangerous would that be? Spell exactly. Book, spell book exactly. The I mean, this is uh, <clears throat> the, 
this is something that I think people could have a lot of fun with and just I almost would love to leave it open-ended because people are going to come up with their own wild ideas of twisted corruption and P is for phlogiston <laughs> <laughs> and if you get one of the, the letters wrong in the typeset it it throws the whole spell off and you're <laughs> yes. when the press explodes <laughs> ever since visiting the one at Carillon Park in Dayton Ohio they have a working printing press there oh yeah that and was so neat seeing the I mean, the way they they like formulate the ink before they spread it out and put it on the rollers. I mean, every little step like that could be its own component. And I just, the music of it is amazing. Um, but we can add that to the list of his inventions is paper and oh, oh, yeah. printer, yeah. printer's ink. <laughs> Technically, he also created paper yeah. towels. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Although in some That's of these inventions, the, the Chinese may have had him beat by a little while, but yeah. honestly, uh, okay, Bob and anybody who's been to Disney World in Orlando will be with me on this. If you're on Spaceship Earth, the pounding of papyrus and everything, and then you get the printing press right after the fall of Rome. So the smell of sulfur just comes a little bit later in the ride. <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to say too soon because the burning smell <laughs> comes from the Library of Alexandria scene. <laughs> too soon. <laughs> too soon. That, that's really where my mind was for a good portion of this. Uh, but it was fun. Uh, I think as far as an NPC to... Uh, really give the judge a little bit more license to run with it, if you will. Tomasis, he, he could just cut them off mid-speech and go into, like, diatribes with non-sequiturs, and you you just kind of have to bring him back around. <laughs> <laughs> just like Martino did. But I think that would be a lot of fun to just throw a party off, off their game just a little bit by not playing along as much as they think I should. And I mean, hijinks and Sue and all that, but it's entertaining. <laughs> and you know, actually, Jen, since, since you mentioned, since you mentioned it, I, I want to give it a, a bigger plug. If you are in the Ohio area, you really owe it to yourself to go to Carillon Park. I mean, besides seeing like a Wright Brothers flyer, they, they have a, a printing press, but also of among the old buildings that have been moved there is like a 1780s tavern. Hmm. And I mean, the, the place is filled with so many bits and pieces of wonderful inspiration to, to walk through and see. The train uh, cars from different eras. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the fact that the interior of the Wright Brothers bicycle shop has been moved there. Um, there is a there's so. an exhibit you can walk through from. I think it, it was one. I think it was the Cleveland flood. It was one of the the major floods in Ohio, and you can see you know here's the water marks as high as you're walking through. They got this high by this time, and if you're the ever looking for, from some of the survivors who were children at the time. So you're thing, saying things like, I saw my dad and he was going across the telegraph lines from building to building trying to get to us. Mm. If you're ever looking for inspiration for for something solid as kind of a linchpin, places like Carolyn Park are a great place to visit. Let's hear it for national parks, hey. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, that's it for me for this one. And we All can right. probably just skip right over me for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Props and audio suggestions. <laughs> I mean, well, Jen, you've got a prop <laughs> suggestion, right? It's, it, it's for the question mark catapults. <laughs> uh, little catapults you can launch things with at the table. It's very fun. <laughs> Here's your dice. You launch it and it rolls right. You know. <laughs> You'll someone with a D20. Yeah, no. <laughs> that way lies liability uh 
<laughs> I, was, I was very similar to, and I, I kind of got stumped here. The only thing I was thinking about was having more of those Roman coins that you could have around the table. It's always fun to have like a practical prop. And there's so many people like at conventions that sell or make their own coins. Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there. I think it in this one, it's the, um, what is Solidus and the Sisteris? Uh, yeah. The, the different you know denominations. And I like that scene of Martin when he comes first there, he goes to the, the exchange. And he's like, well, I've got some lira and I've got you know some some of its nickel and some of its gold and some of its silver. And the guy's looking at it and it's like, yeah, worthless. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you one one of these uh, soldaris you know, for it. So. But it's another fun haggling scene too. But, but you know, just that kind of prop is always kind of a fun thing to have for people to have a tactile experience with. And you know the different conversions i think i've talked about before just having this sort of you know real real sense of like when you go from place to place you may not be using the same money and you may not get a fair deal you know when you're when you're trying to change your goods so. which is something that doesn't doesn't really get brought up i think enough at at the table right yeah you know, well you know you've got these coins from this kingdom well you know here yeah you know, i'll give you the value of it of, of the weight in silver but that's yeah. that's it right mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to kind of this universal denomination that just sort of flows i guess that's really what makes our our settings fantasy right is that <laughs> your money's good everywhere and everybody yeah. speaks a common you language can, you can turn the dial up and down on the realism you know to a certain extent but i think that that being sort of like a something you breeze over all the time I think it's more fun to you know sort of have it um, be a little bit more consequences, right? When you're you're kind of dealing with treasure and loot, and and players just having this sort of yeah, I can just use it and spend it anywhere, and it's like, well, maybe not. You know, maybe it's maybe it doesn't go as far as you'd hope. Um, and there's a yeah. sort of aspect to say you have to go and maybe find the right way to you know use this money. So. Well, and, and yeah, you're right. I mean, you could use Roman coins. There's all sorts of companies, campaign coins. I know uh, Stefan Picorni had done mm -hmm. coins at one point. So there's there's plenty of places, Renaissance fairs, where you could where you get coins like that. I also think that one of one of the things that I have learned over the years of running a face-to-face -face game with a group of adults is sometimes they tend to just stop and overthink things. Mm -hmm. Now they know there's an encounter beyond that door, and two and a half hours later, they still know there's an encounter <laughs> behind that door. And uh, at one point, I had introduced a two drink minimum to my AD and D game. So I think a good prop to have based on this would be brandy. Um, <laughs> Have, have a glass of brandy or two just so they get a little bit more. Yes, yeah, and, yeah. uh, and, and that would have helped. Yeah. yeah. It, it, at least uh, for players who are of age, uh, I'm long past. I'm long past the period where I could get away with contributing oh. to the delinquency of fellow minors. Can we, uh, Ixne, uh, can can we institute like Roman coins as luck tokens? Oh, yeah. oh, totally. That'd be great. Uh, <laughs> use of those props. Yeah. <laughs> we all need more luck tokens. And, right, and so the I'm higher denominations looking... just represent more luck that you have. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Bob, I'm looking at the time. I don't know if we have time for your Spotify play. <laughs> well, well, we don't have time to listen to it. Uh, this show's Spotify list clocks in at about six and a half hours. Wow. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of funny because I really, I really had to put some thought into this one because um, most, most of what we know about Roman music is they stole it from the Greeks, sort of like their gods. <laughs> Uh, it's based on Etruscan music and, and Greek music, but there are some examples out there, and they're they're on the list. There's uh, Music from Ancient Rome, Volume One by Sonalia, uh, Music of Ancient Rome as opposed to From by uh, Claudia Exuperta. Then there's uh, there's an instrument that they played, uh, which is also a Greek instrument, and and so I'm going to probably butcher it, um, Ascalus. They're a, kind of a, a, a bagpipe type instrument. And uh, Ludi Sensini put out two albums, Festini Lenta and um, Wem Mel, Sounds of Ancient Rome. And uh, both of those are, are older music. He also did one that was less pipe and, and more with other instruments called Carpe Diem. And then I started thinking, okay, but we've got a character who came from 1939. <laughs> and I'm a Chicagoan. And, you know, any chance I really have to, to squeeze in some, some Chicago blues, 
not to be confused with Delta Blues. Um, so Chicago Blues Volume 1, which features uh, Alfred Field, uh, Tony Hollins, and Johnny Shines, and Chicago Blues Volume 2 with Gene Gilmore, Leonard Baby Duke Costa, and the Five Breezes, um, Ruth Ladson, and champion Jack Dupree. These are, these are blues artists that most people are not going to be familiar with. And it's kind of a great way, I think, and to kind of start off, start off your music session with that, and then jump into the Roman music. And it really would set the, the, uh, the dichotomy of, of both music and culture and, and really uh, emphasize the, the schism in time and reality. And it's good music. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that's that's what we've got on our Spotify playlist for this show. Ancient right. Roman music and Chicago blues from like 1939 <laughs> to 51. It's like peanut butter and chocolate. They go great together. Yeah, I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, Mark, do you have some words for Mark? Mark, yeah, are we going to have words? <laughs> have words, Mark? <laughs> My favorite part. <laughs> I, I just, yeah, this is the, the, we've had a good streak of like, you know, authors here are really good at, at their obscure words. Um, Spock Camp has a few good ones too. Um, the, uh, the, some of the ones I was going to call out, uh, there is uh, gut take, uh, which is all one word. It's spelled G U T A C H E. And every time I looked at it, I was like, what is that? You know, what is it? And then, of course, you break it apart, gut ache. And this is this uh, combined, you know, word that's used a couple of times in the, oh, in the book. Oh, I yeah. was thinking it as gusta. Uh, I, was, I was thinking like a mustache or like a gutache or you know, something yes. like that. Some, something Italian, but it's it's uh, it's like, it's apparently I, I from I gut's okay. ache, you know, which is this, <laughs> yeah. And so I, when I looked that up, I was like, ah, yes. <laughs> but, but I love how it's just thrown out there and it looks like this foreign word but it's uh it's very clear etymology you know when you look at it together um like satanas being satan but yeah satanas that was good, uh, <laughs> um i came across folk moat um which is a gathering or congregation oh. of the people and that's what they use to elect you know the king in this time it's they call it oh yeah people. and so I, I love that word it's it's very much a almost like a danish or scandinavian type word for you know moot and um a thang you know a thing that they, they do it in iceland and norway um there was a, the other one that i was i was enjoying too was bearding which is a word i hadn't you uh, you know seen in this context before but you know there's one sentence when martinus is like I love burrowing into libraries, but he definitely did not like the idea of bearding a strange banker in a strange land with a strange proposition. And basically, Martin's afraid of confrontation, and this is bearding somebody is this sort of openly, boldly going in and saying, this is what I need, you know? So I, I think it's a good use of that word, which has all their alternative meanings. Yeah, I think the only time I've ever heard it used is bearding the lion in its den. I, I don't think I've yeah. ever heard it in any other context until this book. And that um, always um, brought such a weird picture to my head. So uh, I'm <laughs> glad we have it spelled out now. <laughs> um, but my, my word of the day, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll call it as frowsy. And mostly because I love the way that sounds. Uh, Come on, Bob. That's the word I was trying to think of. <laughs> somebody who's frowsy is unkempt or disheveled. And, you know, Martin, I think, also you know, encounters a few of these, uh, these people in Rome who's who just had their haggard appearance, you know, and, and frowsy is such a good description of that. And that's definitely a word I want to keep in my, um, you know, my, my dictionary for future, for future use. I feel um, personally attacked. <laughs> Not fusty. <laughs> so I, I have some words in here. Hopefully we'll, we'll publish, you know, a list of them along with their, their OED uh, references and things like that. So um, another good, another good book for words. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that takes us to our reskins and inspirations. Uh, Jen, do you want to start us off? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go probably further back than most of you. Uh, most, both of you. 
I'm going to go all the way back to ancient Greece with Aeon, the ancient Greece zines put together by uh, Chris Willett and Sharktopus Games. Nice. It's good enough for the Romans to steal from. Hey, if you're looking for the togas, there we go, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> the origin of. Uh, and I see that uh, my next choice, which was Tower Out of Time, is also on Mark's list. Possibly not for the same reasons, but... Well, so why is it on your list? Tell us about it. Uh, very much for the fish out of water, or serpent out of water, if you will. Yeah. Uh, just the scenario of this is... One of these things is not like the other. You know, this clearly doesn't belong here but it's still trying to make itself that if not at home uh, trying to keep itself alive if you will um and finally i have seeking the post humans by brendan lasalle it is mcc number 10 unfortunately out of print but you can totally pick up the uh, PDF of it. And I do recommend it. It's actually on the cusp of civilization. So it starts out, instead of being either a hunter or a gatherer, there are additional options for your zero or first level characters, as far as classes, uh, a smidge of technology, because you're stepping into the Bronze Age. And so it's MCC, but a little bit more advanced beyond the just, you know, post the post apocalyptic. You know, things are starting to recover a little bit. So I kind of dug that because there's those options to help push it along a little bit and and see just how oh, forward thinking <laughs> some of these characters can be. So, uh, yeah, what about you, Mark? I mean, there, there are no end of to this genre, right? Being well, like, yeah, I was, yours. I was trying to come up with a list of all the time travel, time related adventures that DCC has. And so Tower of Time, right? Because that's you know, the, the tower coming to the, the PC's present. And it has these kind of, you know, these uh, references to animals and creatures that, you know, are extinct or live long ago. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the ones. Not in Kansas anymore by Dieter Zimmerman. You know, we've covered that one before. This is very similar to, you know, this kind of idea of you're taken and in, in back into the past with the things you're carrying and the knowledge you have. And you're you have to use your wits and your um, your abilities and whatever item you took with you uh, to survive. And I can very easily see like that scenario being a branching off point for well, now we're stuck here. You know, we didn't get back to go to our time. How do we build a, a motorcycle and drive off into the the medieval sunset? You know, if we could ever do that. Um, nice. so that's, that's a clear you know one that has uh, uh reskin possibilities because you can have that as an introductory how did they get to the, the past you know and, sure. and where they go from here um there's uh frozen in time you know also by michael curtis the same author as tower of time and frozen in time is you know again is is taking this idea of something that's been in the past and unearthed and now there's this you know adventure that awaits um so a, a, a lovely adventure you know that it has possibilities for maybe you know maybe this is reskinned in the opposite direction you know as far as you know the the there's martins and his and, and the roman cohort are suddenly revealed right you know and so um what does that do to the the pcs present um there was one i came across i haven't read this one yet but i was going to get it and download it and, and and look at it but um it's the inn in the forest by daniel bishop uh, published by trusty sword llc and I believe it's about an inn that's sort of the nexus of this time. And it and basically, you know, the adventure surrounds this, the, the happenings around this inn. Um, so uh, another one to check out. I I, don't, I personally haven't uh, looked into it or read it, but um, it came up in my search um, along with Beyond the Silver Scream. By oh, great Clark. adventure. Great adventure. It has a lot of launching out points that you could take um, for a much more modern sensibility. You know, the theater going, cinematic and 
you have all these kind of you know different places you could put them in based on that and maybe it's a maybe it's a cleopatra and an anthony you know movie they're watching and they're going back to that time or you know something like that where where you have a lot of possibilities depending on what you wanted the historical um, time period to be um i was going to mention another one that i just thought of which is tomb spire of the silver sun by colin mills it was a gong farmer almanac adventure that was in 2018 gong farm almanac and it's a time related adventure where this tower exists in essentially three different times and when you go in or around you know the tower events change and it's all related to this magical artifact um i'd forgotten about that one for a long time and then realized oh yeah that was something that um that we we had in that that gong farmers um a while back and those of you that aren't we don't know the Gong Farmer's Almanac. It's a free zine that was for many years published and had a lot of DCC content. And you can, I believe, get downloads on the Goodman Games website of the PDFs, which have a lot of rich material in them. Um, the and other the thing is- Almanacs are available in hard copy too. They are, that's right. You can get them if you come to the- yeah. the, the, the hardcovers. That's well, they're, they're, they do compilation volumes through, I, I want to say Lulu. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, and the latest the latest Gong Farmer was 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 held up, but as I believe is finally that volume is complete. So yeah, definitely a labor of love <clears throat> for all the fans and you know contributors. So, um, but a lot of fun stuff in there, including you know adventures like Collins uh, that are worth reading. Um, I was the other thing I was thinking about it just in terms of reskin is that. There is the King of Elflands invoke patron result where you go back in time like six seconds or I think or whatever it is, six rounds. And what if the one of the results was you go back in time <laughs> centuries, you know, and, and you, that's a mechanism for getting your players back a, a more built in mechanism, right? You know, that you can you can suggest to players that maybe they rolled really high and they didn't want that result, but they were suddenly, you know, transported back like Martin was. You know, I thought that was kind of a, a maybe a fun entry point that's using the rules as written within. Or the they just owe their problem. patron for rolling back time short period <laughs> and calling the debt due. Yeah, and the, maybe the debt is something they have to do something in the past to make you know the present yeah. uh, right. Um, the last thing I was going to call out is just a shout out to Cthulhu Invictus RPG, which. Um, you know, not DCC, but it's a great uh, resource and it's a fun setting if you want um, some pretty, I think, in-depth or historically accurate, as far as I can tell, you know, um, setting for Roman history in a role-playing game. You could easily, you know, modify that for use in DCC RPG. But I had a lot of fun playing Cthulhu Invictus back in the day. And I don't think they've published it for the seventh edition Cthulhu no, oh, and it's not yeah. Chaosium. I'm I'm trying to remember who publishes it because it's still available. Yeah. It's still available. You can get it for the sixth edition Call of Cthulhu game, um, and there's some uh, some excellent adventures written for it too. So um, you know, look that up. But also, I think you could you know use that as a resource for any kind of historical setting in the Roman era. So, um, but yeah, lots of there's lots of time traveling adventures in DCC. It's a fun concept. It's it definitely hard to pull off. As <clears> I I I know <laughs> from personal experience. So, um, but yeah, um, Bob, what do you, what about you? Well, first of all, if you're not going to toot your own horn, I'm going to mention uh, <laughs> you, there is this dying Earth adventure, Mind Weft of the Moonstone Palace, written by I don't know this guy named Mark Bruner, um, which which is a, a a time travel adventure where you yeah. know, you're bouncing back and forth, and and is fantastic. And I could see, I I could see. Yeah, because some of, some of the things I've been thinking of, of course, you know, obviously not in Kansas anymore, which is a phenomenal adventure. Uh, Beyond the Silver Scream, you know, thing. Okay, so where do they go? You know, how do you? Know, well, then you you can drop them into like uh, Ed Stanek's uh, Pax. I want to say Pax Lexque. I think that's how it's Lex Quay. Lex Quay. There we are. See. Mm -hmm. um, and of I course, they, they could bounce around. They could also, you know, go to the past and pop to the future for the dying earth and back to the past. Because, um, you know, maybe Beyond the Silver Scream is, isn't just a single theater. Maybe it's a twin or a multiplex. Uh, so you get a number of movies playing in different time periods. But um, the Pax Luxway stuff is so fantastic. And, and he's built out. I mean, if you want to go from, from Rome to, to the Isles of the Celts, you can. But just the materials for Rome, there's a, 
a collection of adventures called The Hand of the Law, which is a, a, a group of, is a special group of legionnaires who specifically, their role is to protect the empire from these mystical threats that have, have arisen, because of course this is not just historical Rome, it's DCC Rome. Whoa, yeah. And my absolute favorite uh, is We Who Are About to Die. Which you know puts you know, you can you can engage your players in gladiatorial combat, which is is phenomenal <laughs> stuff. Um, all of all of the historic materials from from Ed Stanek are they are, they really are kind of a must have, I think, for any for any uh, well equipped judges shelves. If you want to be able to draw ideas from beyond essentially mythical Germany with a British accent. Um, it, the stuff that he's got is, is phenomenal. And, uh, some, cool. something that I would, I would, I would strongly recommend and obviously doesn't really require much in the way of, of reskinning. And finally, of course, you know, Jen, how could you not think of Lankmar characters stepping through Ningobble's cave? and finding themselves in ancient Rome. Robles Cave leads so many places. <laughs> you could sure, into... sure, that's out of print, but... <laughs> you, you could fall into a world bubble. I get that. Um, it's I saw it on your list, so I didn't duplicate it. <laughs> <sighs> but but those, those were All really good. my key ideas was... You know, not in Kansas anymore, Silver Scream and in Gobble's Cave as as adventures or settings to to lead your players someplace else. And then you know, uh, wouldn't that be to fun to start with else. like ancient Greece, move them over to Pax Luxway and just kind of angrily trying to steal their gods back, their gods and their music back. Uh progress through time is what i was going to say you know i'm just I, I, i'm just saying you know I'm... we could have bronchosaurus rex somewhere along the way okay <laughs> <laughs> all right we should be done <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we should stop <laughs> save us mark all right well that brings us to our dcc feature for the show um dcc dying earth number nine a new, uh, the newest and latest for, uh, adventure for the Dying Earth uh, setting, Time Tempest at the Nameless Rose by Julian Murnick. And Bob, do you want to give us a description? Sure. Oh boy. This is... <laughs> <laughs> Julian! <laughs> I, I, I could do it if you don't want to. <laughs> no, no, no. Aeons ago, the arch magician Cantalone, renowned for his mastery of the botanical arts produced a perfect rose which entranced all who gazed upon it and conferred superlative prestige on its creator. After a jealous rival snipped it off at the stem, Cantalone labored for the rest of his life to reproduce his masterpiece, dying just after creating another seed to replace it. This seed, along with the scrap of a note penned by the now obscure Cantalone, is found by the PCs in the course of their first mission herein. The note instructs the PCs to plant the seed in good soil and nourish it with well water of three aeons in order to bring it to a full bloom. So this may serve as further inducement to undertake at least one more of the missions offered within. Yeah. So this, this is this is Julian at his Bernickian best. It really is. <laughs> it's it's a great adventure that provides these kind of side quests that you know that can be used for shorter sessions or when everyone's not there but are still part of the greater whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think just first off, it's brilliantly designed. It is brilliantly, brilliantly designed. And uh, it's it's just neat. It's just neat. Uh, Trombley is the time trotter. She has such an awesome <laughs> name to begin with. She is she is such a great wayfarer, and it, I think it's an awesome way to kind of work the decampian time travel uh, 
in into this, you know, the campion for the Carnikian, guard, yeah. guarding back and <laughs> guarding forth, and and bringing bringing people to uh, to the dying earth. I think she is she alone is a great MacGuffin for pulling people forward to the dying earth, just like um, Silver Scream and not in Kansas anymore. A great MacGuffin for taking people to the past. Yeah, it it was definitely yeah you know, when when I was thinking of what could fit in. It was one of those that I don't think many people have had a chance to see yet or read yet because it is fairly new. And um, I, that's always a good thing to introduce people to, you know, new work and, and this being Julian at his best, you know, in terms of like the, the dying earth, um, you know, setting. I love that it's, it's got this very much a, a dying earth uh, feel to it with the inn and the characters that are in it and the you know the the different machinations that each of the um the parties are vested in you know in terms of like okay well you have to do this for me and you might get something out of it but it, there's always this underlying uh evil to the whole place too which is well, and that's and that's one of the things that kind of sets the dying earth adventures apart too yeah. is you know you've got this this cast of characters and they they have the their own motivation yes <laughs> They they are not they are not there merely to give you a rumor or to be stabbed in the face. Uh, they 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 can be obstacles. They can be so many things. And yeah, and you have a lot of fun with that as a judge. So go ahead. Yeah. And they can be tools of the judges or uh, used or manipulated by the players. Yeah, yeah, and and it fits with the story really well in that sense where you have these you know other characters that martin is encountering trying to you know just you know assess their their motivations and in some cases listening to their assassination <laughs> lists and, and going well i'll step away from this for a little while but um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of choices players can make in this you know whether they even pursue the full extent like you said bob or maybe it's just like they visit this inn and they get this you know side quest that takes them you know uh, away for a little bit and they come back and visit it after some time and they full they finally uncover the, the full mystery over a series of you know uh, a series of meetings or, or, or adventures so well it'd be so easy if if your players are having a lot of fun you could easily stretch it out too yeah, you know, yeah. If you're rolling in well it's five aeons and uh, you know, <laughs> drop a few more things in i just want to point out ancient rome is definitely its own aeon right so i mean <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah it is yeah. It, it's a versatile little ad adventure well i don't want to say little adventure i mean it's it's a full-blown adventure but it's <laughs> versatile enough that it's very easy that a judge can can add to it and build upon it and really get you get a lot out of the page julian really knocked it out of the park with this one i think yeah i think it, he and you are the most uh, prolific adventure writers for Dying Earth now. <laughs> <laughs> three and a half or three apiece, I can't remember. And, uh, well, I've got I've got two and a half. Two and a half, yeah, two and a half, yeah. So it's you and Julian are the most prolific. I think Julian Julian has three and a half. He's got Time Tempest, he's got the Vis Punt, and he's got um, the time. DCC number one. Um, and and he's got a, a co-write. Uh, a co-writing credit on number on the obelisk as well, yeah. So he's 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 uh, Dude, he's got two halves. He's got four. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Yeah, he, he always has so much fun with just the you know the language and the names and everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, this he, one he is, does. Is, and if you if you like his other work, you'll love this one. It's it's really good. Oh, I have yeah. this deep seated feeling like I ran through part of this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a scene or two of this as part of a play test and i'm not entirely sure if it was for this adventure or not <laughs> so i'm just gonna sit back and uh wait for bob to run it for me yeah jen's like oh no i, I played this part yeah yeah I, we play tested this with errol otis i'm like i didn't oh. <laughs> i've never <laughs> seen any of this before <laughs> it was a different one she's like oh no there was this part is is this guy in it Yes, and I know nothing about this. I was not involved in this playtest. Yeah, well, it, that's that's what we get for uh, <laughs> waiting three years to publish stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and this is this is why I can't remember if I did catapults for an issue of Crawl because <laughs> yeah, these are problems to have. They certainly are. But uh, no, I, I'm kind of staying quiet on this one because I mean, yeah, Julian he knows he's got all the accolades. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> especially for for dying arts. I'm just yeah. gonna um, yeah, I'll just soak this one in. I've been doing I've been doing so many things that aren't dying Earth in you know orbiting dying Earth these days that you know I haven't run dying Earth for a while although I, I greatly enjoy it but just reading Julian's dying Earth adventures is fun just just for the language and the oh that guy's up oh no you know I just <laughs> the, the motivations and and the characters it's it it's fun to read and i i hope to, to eventually get a chance to run it because they're, it's a solid solid adventure yeah well um is that everything we want to talk about no i think we are ready uh, yeah the so, outro. i'm uh I'm just trying to put a pronunciation in here for you. <laughs> oh, I was more, I, I'm going to, one thing, I, a couple things I forgot. If you're interested in more information from Goodman Games about um, Sprague de Camp, there are a couple of articles on the Goodman Games website yeah. that you can go read. One is The Adventures in Fiction, El Sprague de Camp by Jeff Goad. Um, so that's something you can look up on the, it's more of a comprehensive of all of, Sprague de Camp um, as a as an author, and for those unfamiliar, that's Jeff Goat of the Appendix N podcast. That's our our friend at Appendix N podcast. Yes, and they I think they also covered um, uh, Less Darkness Falls in one of their early episodes, if I remember correctly. They might have. Um, get one hundred and fifty or something now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're not going so fully into the gaming aspect of it, so it's cool. yeah. The other article that's um, definitely worth checking out is um, a look at El Sprague de Camp's Less Darkness Fall by Bill Ward. So you can find that on the Goodman Games website as well. And both are worth checking out for sort of short, um, you know, write-ups of uh, the author we're covering and the book we're covering. All right. Well, that uh, means that we're done for tonight with Sprague de Camp. Um, and I'm going to say that one of the things that we're excited about is um, the Legends of Uganda is now live in the Goodman Game Store in both PDF and Murdered Tree editions. <laughs> you can also watch wow. for the next release from, uh, from author Ashraf Brandon. And okay, here, Jen, I'm going to try this. Indai U Mukhaki. <laughs> Indai Mukhaki, um, which is going to be released shortly on DriveThruRPG. Uh, in the meantime, this brings our last season to a close. Um, oh wait, no! This it, no, this is actually the first. This is the first it, episode yeah. of the new season, kicking it off with um, with a new series. Um, and so next Oops. month, we're going to be picking up another classic, um, Abraham Merritt's novel, The Moon Pool. Um, so very much looking forward really? to revisiting that. Yeah. Oh, oh like, you've read it before, Mark. I have. It's been a while, though, um, so I'm going to reread it for um, for our show. Um, but I remember enjoying it in that uh, merit way. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> it's very much a, a, a early writer with a lot of language that can make it a little unapproachable, but also very fun. So yeah, I, and who knows? I at this better. point, we might feel differently about it after yeah. working with so much Vancey and. Verbiage. <laughs> yeah. Just saying. Well, but that's a good pick. And um, uh, so we'll be resuming, I think, our regular schedule. So this will be the um, the next, it'll be February 13th, I think, is when that'll be uh, going off. Is that right, Bob and Jen? I Sounds right. We will so. triple check with the Twitch mistress. Yep, it'll be, it should be the, the second Tuesday. So it'd be February 13th. All right. Um, but if you are enjoying the show, please comment uh, on the podcast or help us by posting a review on iTunes or YouTube. Those ratings and reviews help new listeners find the podcast and our community. Any last thoughts, folks? Yeah. Um, it's It's been two weeks now, and it, it's, it's still kind of rough. Uh, for those who don't know, 
uh, Janelle Jaquais passed away uh, this month, and I'd been working on uh, well, Dark Tower and Caverns of Thracia, and uh, had worked with her. I mean, not like side by side in the trenches, but but you know, when I had ideas or questions, or thoughts, she was always there. And, uh, and her passing has been really rough, I think, for a lot of us, and she's going to be greatly missed. She will. Um, tangentially, we will be able to get our hands on the final product of the Dark Tower sets for 5e and DCC very, very soon. Um, we, as in Goodman Games, just opened the backer kit so that you can finalize your mailing address and everything. So. I'm, I'm glad that many more people will get to access her yes. works um, through this you know product and hopefully that's something that um people will enjoy you know and uh, really take heart to what she contributed to um our fun role-playing you know community so even even if even if you're never going to run adventures that large right but, you know, adventures that that can take months to, to run are certainly are not necessarily as in vogue as they once were they're worth reading because they are a master class in dungeon design mm -hmm. they are they're phenomenal i was i was fortunate to, to get to work with her and we were all fortunate that that she was in the rpg industry okay. so uh, yeah and if just wait till you see cavern to thracia <laughs> Dark Towers can be glorious, but wait till you see Thracia. <laughs> well, uh, my other last thought would be tune in uh, next Monday for Spellburn, where we talk to more people in the community. Awesome. Well, there you have it. Uh, we hope we've inspired you, and thank you all for listening. Good night.